examples. And you know, every, everybody's in, interested in, in the, uh, the mission to Mars, uh, planetary resettlement. We're talking about reusability for the launch vehicle. Uh, what are your thoughts on in-space resource utilization? Uh, for example, water, oxygen, soil uh, from the moon, perhaps, maybe to go to Mars. Uh, do you have any plans to uh, utilize resources um, in space for the mission to Mars? Uh, nope. I mean, apart from uh, orbital refilling, mm -hmm. I think uh, that's very important. So you've got to. So there's one ex besides a fully and re fully and rapid rapidly reusable um, rocket. You need to also have orbital refilling or retanking. Mm -hmm. That's got to be that's fundamental because um, then you can essentially recoup. Uh, all of your mass fraction delta V in Earth orbit. You can leave with full tanks. Um, and it could, could be from immediate low Earth orbit or you know, something that's maybe elliptical or something like that if you want to go higher energy. But that's, that's crucial for getting to, to Mars. The, the moon is neither here nor there. Um, I mean, using the moon would be like, OK, if you want to cross the Atlantic, maybe you want to go to Iceland. Probably not. you know. But, you know, to visit, sure, but you know, it's not like a mandatory stop, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and also, for the mission to Mars, um, what advancements, we, we talk a lot about hardware and physics problems, and, and what about advancements in software? Um, you know, the reason I bring this up, it, it recently, it, are you familiar with the game designer Jonathan Blow? He, referenced you in a keynote he was given, and he said that you, you had talked about technology naturally decays because skills naturally fade. And one of the things he identified was a decay in software, um, a de degradation in software. Uh, is this something we have to address in, in, in doing something like going to Mars, and since all of this stuff runs on software? Well, so software is an increasing part of any piece of technology. Um, I mean, Tesla, the car is extremely configurable. It's basically like a laptop on wheels. Um, so software matters enormously there. Um, and, and really, for, for example, for full autonomy, the only gating factor is software. Mm -hmm. The hardware is all there that's required and has been for the last couple of years. Uh, well, well, the final piece of hardware was upgrading the computer to have more compute power. Um, so software is extremely important. Um, the point you're alluding to, which is that, you know, what I was referring to is technology does not automatically improve. Right. Uh, people are used to the phone being better every year. Um, although, and I'm an iPhone user, but I think like some of the recent software updates have been like not great, certainly feeding it to that point. Um, it's like broke my email system, like what the, this is like quite fundamental. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, there sure is a lot of software out there, and some of it's like the, the people that wrote it are retired or maybe dead, you know, so like, now how do you fix it? It's going to be an issue. Um, I think we definitely need a lot more smart people working software. Um, and not just troubleshooting old problems. Not just trouble of shooting old problems. It's actually very important to retire old code bases and, and not just maintain them forever because mm -hmm. the, the, the difficulty of maintaining them j becomes extremely high. Yeah. And at a certain point, you just got to redo the code base. Mm -hmm. So we'll come back to the Mars mission because I know we've got some uh, audience questions on that. You know, we're at a satellite conference, so I'm going to ask you some questions about satellites. Uh, Starlink. Um, what's the long term? vision for Starlink. Uh, how do you see the role of Starlink as it relates to mobile broadband and 5G? Uh, sure. So I mean, the, the, the whole purpose of SpaceX is really to help make life multiplanetary. Um, and then, but the revenue potential of launching, rock, launching satellites, servicing the space station and whatnot, that's, you know, t taps out around $3 billion a year. Um, but I think uh, providing broadband is, is more like 
an order of magnitude more than that, probably 30 billion a year mm -hmm. um, as, as a rough approximation. Um, and we're still like probably below 5% at that point. So it's not like, I want to be clear, like, it's not like Starlink is some huge threat to telcos. I want to be super clear, it is not. <laughs> Uh, in fact, it will be helpful to telcos because uh, Starlink will, ha will, will um, serve the hardest to serve customers that uh, telcos otherwise have trouble doing with, with landlines or even with, with uh, cell radio stations, you know, with cell, cell towers. Mm -hmm. um, 5G is, is, is great for high density situations like being here in DC or, you know, New York, San Francisco, that kind of thing. 5G is great for high density situations, but it's actually not great for um, the, the countryside. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for rural areas, it's it's not it's not great. You need you need range, um, and so any, any any kind of sparse environment, uh, 5G is, is really not not well suited. Um, but it's great great for in, for for city dense dense city situations. So Starlink will effectively serve the I don't know three or four percent hardest to reach customers for telcos or, or people who simply have no connectivity right now um, or the connectivity is really bad. So I think it, it will be actually helpful um, and take a, a significant load off the traditional telcos. Okay. And I was, I was going to ask you what, what customers uh, you know, were ideally suited for Starlink, but I guess since you mentioned that it would be, it would be these uh, three to four percent at the very something like that um, at the very edge. W what is the customer uh, experience like then for those people, and what's the cost of, uh, of acquiring those services? Um, well, it will be a, it should be a good experience because it'll be very low latency, mm -hmm. um, and we're targeting latency below 20 milliseconds. Uh, so somebody could 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 play a a fast response video game uh, at a competitive level. Right. Like that's the threshold for uh, the latency. Um, so, uh, so then, and, and bandwidth, the bandwidth is a very complex question. Um, but let's just say somebody will be able to watch high def movies, mm -hmm. um, play, play video games, and do all the things they want to do without noticing speed. Right. Um, and then the, the, the challenge for anything that is uh, space-based is that the, the size of the cell is gigantic. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's, like I said, it's great for, for uh, very low to maybe, maybe medium s uh, sort of sparsity situations, but it's not, uh, it's not good for high density situations. So we'll, we'll have some small number of customers in LA, but we, we can't do a lot of customers in LA because the bandwidth per cell is, is simply not uh, high enough. Um, what does is, what is the equipment on the ground look like for this? Or... Yeah, um, so the, the, the ground equipment just looks like, uh, well, I think it's, like I said, I think it looks like a little, U, looks like a UFO on a stick. Mm -hmm. um, so the, at least the version one of the user terminal will actually have actuators on it so that it can, it, it can um, improve the pointing accuracy. So you don't have to, it's very important that you don't need a specialist uh, or something to install. Um, it, the, the goal is that this, the, the, the instructions in the box will, there's just two instructions and they can be done in either order. Uh, point at sky, plug in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you do it either order, sequence doesn't matter, and it will work. Plug and play. Literally, <laughs> but also point at sky. <laughs> point <laughs> at <laughs> you can't see the satellites. If you, if you can't see the satellites, it can't see you. Mm -hmm. um, just <laughs> wanted to talk about just some of the design uh, concerns that were raised by astronomers. Um, you can talk about little, a little bit about how you working, maybe working with astronomers to alleviate these concerns, or, or are you working on the design or altering it, or, or is, are the concerns uh, overblown? I mean, how do you feel about what has been raised? Um, I. I am confident that we will not cause any impact whatsoever in astronomical discoveries. Okay. Zero. That's my prediction. So you're not it, launching them we'll take corrective action if it's above zero. <laughs> so you're not giving like Orion a hat or anything like that. You're, everything's 
No, I mean, there's, there's a, sometimes people get a little excited because when the, when the satellites are first uh, launched, mm -hmm. that they're, they're, they're tumbling a little bit, so they're, like, they're kind of like, they're going to blink um, and because they, they haven't stabilized. Um, and then, and they're they're raising their orbit, so they're they're lower than you'd expect, and they're kind of necessarily going to reflect in ways that is not the case when they're on orbit. Uh, but now now that the satellites are on orbit, uh, I'd be impressed if if somebody can actually tell me where where all of them are. Mm. I've not met someone who can tell me where all of them are. Not even one person. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So that I mean, it can't be that big of a deal. Ha <laughs> ha.